How's it going, y'all? How's it going? Awesome. Word up. So thank you all. Uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, my name is Alejandro Jimenez. I am a poet, educator, and writer. Um, so again, uh, thank you for being here. Th thank you uh, to TEDxCSU uh, for inviting me um, uh, once again. Um, it's super nice to be back here and sharing my work. Um, before I get started, I want to acknowledge the original peoples of this area whose land we stand on. So thank you so much to the you people, uh, the Cheyenne people, the Arapaho people. Thank, thank you uh, to every single Native American group across the nation uh, for showing us how to fight to keep our cultures, our traditions, um, and our languages. Um, as a poet, as a writer, and as a storyteller, I, I deeply believe that the more we tell our own stories from our own perspectives, the less we'll be forgotten, the harder it will be to erase us, and the less we forget about who we are. Um, I am an immigrant to this country. Um, I came from Mexico, and today I would like to share with you all a couple of poems, uh, a couple of stories about my experience on trying to navigate, uh, navigate this, this country and my journey uh, to get to where I am today. All right, so um, the first poem that I'll share with you all, it's, uh, it's titled Mexican Education. It goes like this. My first image of the United States of America came on November 11th, 1995. I was waiting in the parking lot underneath the lights of a magical place. My uncle said, here you find anything. With his help, I pronounced my first real words in English. Gu, a, mar. Wa, mar. My aunt walked out of this place with the green blanket. She wrapped it around my shivering body. I had illegally crossed the border less than two hours before, and suddenly I was warm with a big smile on my face. I made it, I thought. I made it. When my mother registered me for the third grade in January of 1996, my ESL teacher had trouble with the multiple syllables in my name. She said, Alejandro is too long, let's call him Alex. My mother looked at the floor and said, okay. It wasn't until years later when I knew enough English and assimilation that I realized what had happened. Now, most of my family members do not call me by my birth name. That same year, I met Mrs. Perry. She would not allow me to go to the bathroom until I pronounced my request correctly. Most of the time, I would piss myself. At that time, I didn't know enough English to cuss her out. So instead, in high school, I would run by her house and spit on her nice lawn. <laughs> in fourth grade, an ESL assistant would kick my shins underneath the table every time I would mispronounce any of the words she was holding on a flashcard. Until this day, I do not find high heels to be attractive. Fifth grade. It was pretty good. Fred Trujillo, our custodian, would hand out ice cream sandwiches to students that were doing well in classes. I got two ice cream sandwiches. In, uh, in sixth grade, while sitting in the back of the bus with three white kids, Malia Hadley, whom I had a crush on, asked me, Alex, is it true that they call Mexicans beaners? I should have known from her smile that she did not want to actually broaden her knowledge. I remember having beans the night before for dinner that I didn't think about the implication of her question. Yes, I said, we are called Beaners. Everybody laughed. I wanted to ask her if white people were called hamburger eaters, but that didn't sound quite as mean. I stopped sitting in the back of the bus. In seventh grade, my science teacher compared Mexico to trash. He is the reason why I dislike science. In eighth grade, my friends and I jumped each other and started our own gang. 
We were afraid of what the following school year would hold. After all, that was the furthest any of our parents had gone to school. I guess punching each other was how we showed support and guidance. Later, some would drop out. Some would actually join gangs. Some joined the military, and we would not recognize them after their tour. Some would graduate. Very few would go on to college in high school. I was one of four brown faces in AP classes in a school that was 30% Mexican. I always felt weird when my teachers praised me for not being like the rest of them. What is this rest of that I am not? I left my guidance counselor jaw drop when I told her I wanted to attend college. Instead of guiding me through that vacation process, she asked me to, to talk to incoming students and their families about my success story of how you came from nothing to something. My grandmother's house in Mexico didn't have running water, electricity, flushing toilets, steak dinners, wood floors, a picket fence, but it was something. By this time, I was very confused by the phrase, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Mexican boots don't have straps. In college, I indulged myself in race relation classes. It is amazing how many people that got it would often expect two things of me. One, act more Mexican, or two, act less Mexican. You cannot help liberate people if you constantly push them into boxes. I, I am a green card holder now. I still have trouble pronouncing some English words. My tongue wrestles with itself. It does not know which kind of language it prefers. I ask my intuition for good judgment in navigating this country, but sometimes it feels like I am asking for too much. When my aunt wrapped me in the warmth of the green blanket, I, I thought I had made it. But Mexican education in this country means they will shorten your name to fit their mouths more easily. Sometimes you will think it is easier too. They will be surprised when you want to be successful. Sometimes you will be surprised as well. They will tell you that you are better than the rest of them. Sometimes you will believe them. They will try to turn you against people that look like you sometimes. They will win. But I am learning. I am learning how to thrive in a country where I am not wanted if my name is Alejandro, if my skin is too dark, if my accent is too heavy. When my aunt wrapped me in the warmth of the green blanket, I thought I had made it. But Mexican education in this country means we have to reclaim ourselves in more than one language means it is okay if we demand our names be pronounced correctly. Do not be afraid to wrap your mouth around our history. Means we have to cling on to our culture like the sun to dusk, like moon to dawn. Means even in the dark we have to shine despite how they want to bury us. We need to become a phoenix before they turn us into ash. Means we are still here. All beautiful and brown, and resilient, and joyous, all of us here, so full of possibility, and capable of anything, knowing that this country is not as magical as you once thought, but we make our own magic every single day. Thank you. Uh, to whomever snapped about that, uh, when I said about the Mexican boots and the straps, thank you so much. I, I didn't feel alone. Thank you so much. Um, so I, I've been an educator in public schools for the last 10 years of my life, right when I got out of college, right? Um, and I've, been, I've had the privilege of working with youth and their families and different community members in, in, the, in the different positions that I've held over the last 10 years within schools. Uh, I've been a, a, a youth organizer, a parent organizer, 
Um, I've been a tutor, a mentor, a librarian, an after-school program manager, a teacher, and currently I am a restorative, restorative practices coordinator in a, in a public school in Denver. Um, and over, uh, if you've all kept up with the news over the, last, um, over the last years, we've seen a resurgence of the labor movement um, across the nation uh, through the teacher strike, right, uh, from, uh, from West Virginia, uh, Chicago, uh, Oklahoma, Arizona, LA, Oakland, Pueblo, Colorado, Denver, Colorado most recently, right? And I am so happy that teachers are standing up, right, and, and using their voice, showing us once again how to use our voice, right, to call out all the injustices within the, uh, 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 the education system, specifically how, how workers are treated within that system, right, uh, specifically thinking about uh, teachers, right? Um, and I believe that shedding light to that issue is just the tip of the iceberg of everything that's wrong uh, within the education system, right? Especially when we think about how the education system has been used against Native American people in an attempt to assimilate them, right? Especially if we think about how, uh, how students of color are treated within that education system that sees success uh, often uh, very generic. Right, uh, monolingual, uh, monocultural, one size fits all, right? Um, I think about my own experience as an immigrant uh, student navigating that system. I think about all the families that I've been able to work with um, and all the students over the last 10 years and their struggles navigating that system. I think about my mother, right? Um, and I think about how worried she was about me being in a, new, in a new country and if I would fit in, if I would make friends in school or not. I think about the response I would give to her when she would question me about uh, coming home with my pants when in third grade, right? And the answer was always the same. My friends made me laugh, uh, and, and so I wept myself. And she would shake her head in frustration because she knew she had to wash the pants again, uh, but she would smile, relieved that I had found friends, right? So the following poem, and the last poem I'll share with you all before I get off stage, is about that experience. Um, but it's also about how um, all the injustices that we see right now in, in, within the education system have deep, deep historical roots. Um, the poem is titled, um, I Apologize. And it goes like this. When I was in third grade, about three times a week, I would come back home with my pants wet from my own pee. You see, Mrs. Parrott wouldn't allow me to go to the bathroom because I wasn't pronouncing my request correctly. Blame it on these cheekbones, Mrs. Parrott. This bent, out of shape jaw passed down to me by martyrs who hold secrets that I wish I could understand. Many times, I've wanted to stop its clenching, but my mouth is like my people. We don't deal well with assimilation or systems of oppression. Despite the Bible shoved down to the bottom of my stomach, the paper cuts on my gums can tell you of what we have been through. Lynching? It doesn't just happen by the neck, Mrs. Parrott. You see, my tongue was treated like Emmett Till, beaten, strangled, thrown into the bottom of Lago Texcoco, hung, decapitated in this place, cut off like braids upon arrival to boarding school, stretched in four directions like Tupac Amaru until he ripped. So I apologize for my mispronunciation. If I made you point your ear towards my mouth, I am sorry. I never meant to make you waste your energy, but I have bodies suspended from my vocal cords and their dangling feet scratch the base of my throat. So I apologize if I stutter, Mrs. Parrott, there are memories of conquistadores feeding babies to dogs buried inside of my tongue that I wish I couldn't remember. That's why sometimes you have to ask me to repeat myself. That's why sometimes you have to ask me to repeat myself because my brother 
empty grumbling stomach from searching for food in Tijuana dumpsters at the age of two after being deported with my mother that now washed down my saliva enough to have your words roll off the tip of my tongue flawlessly. I apologize, Mrs. Parrott, because my native language refuses to die because there are temples planted on top of my teeth. That's why they are called wisdom, and that's why I won't go to the dentist, because they will just try to take them out, because like the blankets you gave us, Mrs. Parrot, I have smallpox for taste buds, and they get in my way when I try to speak, so I apologize if I mumble my annunciation is not the best, Mrs. Parrot. It's because Mesa Verde was carved into the inner walls on my cheeks long before its current place. I can show you, but you wouldn't understand, just like you don't understand why it is that I keep quiet sometimes. It's because I have Sitting Bull's headdress hanging from the roof of my mouth, and I am afraid you may want to steal it just like you did it with this Black Hills. I am sorry if my lips are too stiff to shape your words correctly. They are still dry from our desert walk to get to this country, Mrs. Parrott. Did you advise my previous employers to send me to speech classes? Did you ever imagine how it is that I explained to my mother that I peed my pants? Again, again, and again, Mrs. Parrott, I really, really need to go. I've been holding this for such a long time, and I need to let it out. It might smell like genocide, like burnt ancient scriptures, but you told me to pronounce my words correctly, and for me, that means to speak the truth as proof that I have mastered your language. I wrote you this note. So, Mrs. Parrott, may I please go to the bathroom? Thank you all so much. Enjoy yourselves.